family can make you glad. Your family can do you good. But family requires mercy and forgiveness. Sometimes we'll get just, just so upset with the members of our family. But the fact is, they are family. Their blood. And we have to show compassion. We have to be the better of the two. Especially if they're not redeemed. How will they ever come to redemption if they don't see the love of Christ in us? So sometimes we have to be that better person. And that can be real tough. So we're talk, picking up the story that we have been on. This Bible truth. And up to this point, Laban found out that Jacob left. And he's been chasing him. It's taken him seven days. Can you imagine with every day how much matter he was getting? Here, they had taken off, taken all their sheep and everything with them, all his son, his daughters, all his grandchildren, all and left. Oh, and by the way, and stolen his, what he considered to be his gods, his idols, out of his house. And Laban was told on the third day that Jacob had fled, and he took his brethren with him and pursued for seven days' journey and overtook him in the mountains of Gali. But God had come to Laban the Syrian in a dream at night and said to him, Be careful what you speak to Jacob, neither good nor bad. So Jacob overtook Jacob, I mean, Laban overtook Jacob. Now Jacob had pitched his tent in the mountain, and Laban and his brethren pitched in the mountain of mountains of Gali. So they didn't pitch right next to each other. There's a little bit of distance, okay? He wasn't just going to come in there and, hey, everything's good and fine. No, he's got some separation here so that they can have a little buffer zone. And Laban said to Jacob, what have you done? You have stolen away, unknowns to me, and carried away my daughters like captives taken with the sword. Why did you flee away secretly and steal away from me and not tell me? For I might have sent you away with joy and song and timbreth and heart. Do you really think that would have happened? When you look at the history between these two people, <laughs> Laban hasn't been really good to him. Didn't like him in the end. All Laban's sons were mad at Jacob because they feel like they stole away all of what belonged to my daddy. Okay? I don't think that's how it would have gone if Jacob had just gone in and said, Hey, I'm going home. Laban would probably say, Well, all this belongs to me. You just go ahead and leave. Okay? I don't think there's a lot of honesty in what he's saying. And you did not allow me to kiss my sons and daughters. Now you have done foolishly in doing so, and so doing. It is in my power to do you harm. But God of your father, notice he didn't say my God. He said God of your father spoke to me last night. Now think about this. Go to the picture, <laughs> the next slide. This is a non-believer. God many times came to his people and spoke to them and sent an angel, which the word for angel and the word for messenger, the idea is a Roman courier. Okay? The general would write a note. He would seal the note. He would seal the note with his signet. He would put it in a pouch and he'd hand it to a courier. And that courier would go so far, pass it off to another courier, to it got to the other end, and then that sealed note would be opened up. That is the image idea that we have here and what's going on. God sent his messenger to speak to him. But what does he speak? Okay? Think about that. These aren't the angel's words. These are words from God. He is a direct messenger. He's only going to speak what God told him to speak.
And God told the messenger to say to Laban, Be careful that you speak to Jacob neither good nor bad. He didn't say, you leave Jacob alone, or you go back where you came from. He said, when you meet up with him, don't accuse him, or don't say good to him. You be neutral, and let's see how Jacob handles this. Because Jacob could have handled it in one or two ways. He could have blown up on, on Laban, right? That's what happens in families. You come at me with something like this, with accusations, and I can blow up on you, and is that going to make things better? No. Or I can handle it with patience and try to work through it. So that's what God is saying here. Let's see how Jacob handles this. Let's see if he shows that he's one of my children and how he handles it. So let's see how Jacob handles this. And now you have surely gone gone because you were greatly longed for your father's house. But why did you steal my gods? Here it comes. What's it about? The golden and silver images that were taken from him. Then Jacob answered and said to Laban, Because I was afraid, and I said, Perhaps you would take your daughters from me by force. Which is probably what would have happened. With whomever you find your gods, do not let him live. In the presence of our brethren, identify what I have of yours and take it with you. For Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen them. So Jacob is just saying, hey, I didn't take them. If somebody in my group took them, you put them to death. Now let's see further family infamy here. Okay? So here it's down. He says, go ahead and search. See if you can find your stuff. And you lay it out here on the ground before us so that we can get this right. And Laban went to Jacob's tent and to Leah's tent and into the two maids' tent, but he did not find them. Then he went into, to, out of Leah's tent and entered into Rachel's tent. Now, Rachel... I don't know if you've noticed this about Rachel. She was the pretty girl. She was the last one to have children. Okay? She was Jacob's favorite. But all along, look at the heart that you have with Rachel. Now, Rachel had taken the household items and put them into the camel's saddle and sat on them. And Laban searched all the tent and did not find them. And she said... To her father, let it not displease you, my lord, that I cannot rise before you, for the manner of women is on me. And he searched, but he did not find them. She had them the whole time. And she used being a woman, and things that happen with women, to keep him from searching the saddle where it was hidden. Now let's see what happens here. So, he didn't get his idols back. Then Jacob was angry and rebuked Laban, and Jacob answered and said to him, What is my trespass? And what is my sin that you have, have so hotly pursued me? Although you have searched all my things, what part of your household things have you found? Set it here before my brethren and your brethren that they may judge between us both. Okay? Dishonesty. Okay? This is dishonesty. Now, is Jacob pure in his heart? He is because he doesn't believe that they have them. But all the time, Rachel has these. We're going to see late in the later part of this reading, probably in the next two or three readings, how God repays this incident of unfaithfulness. Two unfaithfulness. Number one, she stole. Okay? And what did she steal? Foreign gods. And what did she do? She brought them into the house of Jacob. Three, she lied about having them. I think... If she had told Laban, yes, I took them, I'm sorry, it would have been okay, but she didn't. She lied about it. 
And God will repay her for this. We'll see later on. These 20 years have I served you, your, served you. Your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried their young, and I have not eaten rams of your flock. That which was torn by beast I did not bring to you. I bore the loss of it. You required it of my hand, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. There I was, and, day, and the day of the drought consumed me and the frost of the night, and my sleep departed from my eyes. Thus I have been in your house for 20 years. I have served you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flocks. And you have changed my wages 10 times unless, my, unless the God of my fathers, the God of Abraham and the fear of Isaac had been with me. Surely you had have sent me away empty handed. God has seen my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuke you last night. So in Jacob's eyes, he's right. In Jacob's eyes, he's done what he's supposed to do. In Jacob's eyes, God has protected him. I think if Jacob had known that, he, that the uh, idols had been stolen, he would have been the first to get them out of his house. Because he knows the law of God is that you're not to have any foreign gods other than me. I'm your only God. He wouldn't have let that stand. And Laban answered and said to Jacob, These daughters are my daughters, and these children are my children, and these flocks, and this flock is my flock, and all you see is mine. Hear what Laban's saying? This is all mine. It's not yours. But what can I do this day to these my daughters or to their children to whom they have born? Now, therefore, come let us make a covenant, you and I, and let it be a witness between you and me. So he is wanting to make a, a peace treaty. He's saying, you're not going to hurt me when you grow to be a big nation, and I'm not going to grow hurt you when you grow up. Guess what? This covenant lasts down through the years between those two people. It wasn't until the children of Laban many, many generations later attacked Israel that Israel ever went back and did anything back to them. So it held as long as the peace held for many hundreds of years. So they are setting up a covenant between these two peoples, this one in Syria and this one who, is, who will end up in Canaan that will last. Let's look at how they set up the covenant. So Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar. Then Jacob said to his brethren, gather stones. And they took stones and they made a heap and they ate on the heap. God has said that if you're going to honor me and you want to make an altar or pillar, you're not to put a tool to it. He doesn't want shaped stones. He wants them just like they came up. He says, I made those stones. I don't need you to make them any nicer than the way I made them. Just stack them up and I'm good. Make your altar that way. So they stacked up stones. Laban called it Jager Shudotha. But Jacob called it Gaily, and Gaily became the name of the town and the city later on in years. And Laban said, This heap is a witness between you and me this day. Therefore, its name was called Gaily. And Laban said, This heap is a witness between you and me. Therefore, it's called Gaily. Also, Mizpath. Where do we hear the word Mizpath again? Mizpath came the first place they put an altar when they came back into Israel after the children of Israel left Egypt. That's where they served God was in Mizpah. And this is the place that it happened is where they set up this stone pillar. Because it said, may the Lord watch between you and me when we are absent from one another. And if you afflict my daughters or if you would take other wives besides my daughters, 
There is no man with us to see. God is witness between you and me. He's saying, this is it. This is your family. Don't bring other foreign women into this household. You take the ones you've got now and you grow your, your whole family off of those people. Then Jacob offered a sacrifice on the mountain and he called his brethren to eat bread. And they ate bread and they stayed all night on the mountain. And early in the morning Laban arose, kissed his sons and daughters, blessed them, and Laban departed and returned to his place. Folks, this could have gone a whole lot worse. This could have been ugly. This could have ended in bloodshed. But it didn't. Why? Because of the way Jacob handled it. He handled it the way God wanted him to handle it. God let it go to see how he would handle it. But he didn't tell Laban not to confront Jacob. He didn't tell, tell Laban to go back home. He said, don't say good or bad to him. Let's see what happens. And Jacob did a good job. Jacob did it the way God would want him to do it. He handled it with patience. He handled it with justice. Then Laban said to Jacob, Here's the heap, and here's the pillar I have placed between you and me. This heap is a witness, the pillar is a witness, and I will not pass beyond this heap to you, and you will not pass beyond this heap to me to harm. And God of Abraham, the God of Nahor, and the God of their fathers judge between us, and Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac. How do we handle things in our own families? Do we argue? Do we fuss? Do we get mad at each other, which has happened in my family, and not speak to each other for tens of years? And one of those incidents that, that happened, it was a total misunderstanding what the one person thought the other person had done. They never did in the first place. But when you get mad at somebody, what do you do? It's the first thing that stops communication. You stop talking. And then it festers. And it gets, gets, it grows inside of here. What is one of the attributes of a Christian supposed to be? Forgiveness. How many times are we supposed to forgive? Seventy times seven. As many times as it takes, we're supposed to forgive. We have to be the better person. Why? Because Christ commanded us to be. If the rest of the family is mad, my mama's family got mad at my daddy and wouldn't speak to him for probably 20 years over something that never happened. Something he was accused of that the person who accused him on the, their deathbed finally admitted it never happened before my mama's family would ever speak to my daddy. Okay? That's not how it's supposed to be, folks. Now, my daddy never accused. He never got mad. He just gave it to God. He says, sooner or later, this is going to come out. And it did. Second time, my Uncle Junior stole everything that my grandmother had when my grandfather died. Even went down and forged my daddy's name at the bank to get all my grandmother's and grandfather's money out of their bank account. Oh, my gosh. Okay? Stole all my grandfather's guns and went down and hopped them. While my dad was gone away on a trip, now, my dad could have hated his brother. My dad could have been mad at his brother for years and years over this. All my dad said was, Junior, do, do right by mom. Do right by mom. What Junior do? He took all that money and everything else, used it to buy equipment for his construction company, built mom like he promised a house, but he mortgaged the house. And when his construction company went belly up, the bank took Momo's house. 
and she was kicked out of her own house and spent the rest of her life to the day she died living with my dad, my, my mom. On her deathbed, she looked at my dad and she says, Alan, could you tell Junior to give me my money back? Dad could have hated Junior for the rest of his life for what he did. The whole family did because Junior told everybody that Daddy had stolen the money. And for years, both of his sisters believed what Junior said because he's the older brother. And that family was torn apart for a long, long time over these things. But finally, the truth came out. Finally, the truth came out. Did that end the evilness that Junior did in the family? No. There was more. But in every case, my daddy forgave him. My daddy forgave him. No matter how ugly it was he did, daddy forgave him. Because he knew that it wasn't up to him to judge Junior. That's going to happen on the other side. Daddy cared more about his own family and keeping things together and showing his love. Now, as the last thing that did happen is on the day that Daddy died, Junior showed up at my mama's house and told everybody, this is my house. Y'all need to get out. I looked Junior straight in the face and said, Junior, you need to get in your car and you need to leave right now because my older brother, who's a hothead, has gone in there to get the gun to shoot you like Danny told him to do if you showed up. And Junior left. And that was the last time I ever saw my uncle Junior. But I forgave him for what he did. I even had to repent because one of the things that I had said in my earlier younger life is that the day that Junior died, I would defecate on his grave. And I had to repent of that and those thoughts. It's not my job to judge. We're Christians. It's our job to forgive. Judgment belongs to the Lord. Oh, is that easy? I just related a whole lot of things that people can get really mad about and could hate people for a long time for. But I had to give it over to the Lord. Was he doing it to me? He did several things to us personally, too. But you know what? In the end, I love my Uncle Junior. I couldn't help the fact he was a snake. I still loved him. I still wanted the best for him. But I never saw him after that day. I think that's because on the way out of town, the sheriff, whose mother... He had stolen her property from, met him going out of town and told him if he ever came back to that county, he'd put him in prison. So just because somebody else is not a nice person and doesn't do the right things does not give us the right to hate them, judge them, and not forgive them. Now, is that easy? No, that's Christianity advanced. Yes, it is. That's advanced Christianity. A new Christian, when I was a new Christian, there's no way I could have done that. That took God working on me a long time to be able to forgive my uncle Junior. Okay? But that's what happens in families. This story is a blessing. It ended on a good note. They departed, maybe not as the best of friends, but they at least departed on the civil note saying that I'm not going to hurt you and you're not going to hurt me. When they parted ways. That's something you got to look at. And if there's things going on or has been going on in your family and has been lingering a long time, you need to look in the mirror and search your heart as a Christian. What would Jesus have you to do about the situation? Would he want it to linger on and on and on and hatred to stay in your heart? Or would he want you to forgive even if the other person never says they're sorry or never repents? That's not your job. 
It's up to you to repent. It's up to you to hand out that hand of forgiveness. And that ain't easy, folks. That's asking a lot. But you know what? Jesus gave a lot so that you would have the right and through the Holy Spirit the ability to do these advanced Christian things. Father, thank you so much for this wonderful story. And thank you for how it shows how a situation in a family could have gone really, really wrong. How there could have been bloodshed here. But you intervened and you gave Jacob the opportunity to do the right thing. And he did. And it diffused the situation. And in the end, it made it to where they could leave each other without hatred and everything, tagging on for years and years and keeping a family separated. So Father, if there's something in our hearts that we're hanging on to, if there's some bitterness against any person that we're hanging on to, your command is that we let it go. We're, your command is for us to be the better person because we're the redeemed. Don't expect unredeemed people to act like redeemed people. We're the redeemed. And it's up to us to do the forgiving. So I thank you, Father, for this whole story and all that it's been about. Be with us. If you need to come up to altar to pray about something, it's available. As we go into our family time and you speak to your Father, if you need to talk to me, I'm here. If you need to just sit in your seat and pray, now's the time for that. But if whatever your need is, now's the time for you to speak to your Father who's listening to you in Jesus Christ's name. I want to thank you for joining us here at Frontline Baptist Church here in Coco, Florida. I hope you're getting a blessing from this sermon series. Once again, thank you for joining us here at Frontline Baptist Church in Coco, Florida.